Well, hello, California. Hello. That's where we are tonight, right, Vi? We're in California? Yes. Thank you very much. So. <laughs> uh, by the way, my sister, Fi, Fi and Lesby, where are you at? She's um, hiding. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to introduce you, Fi. Uh, okay. Anyway, Fi is my sister, and she travels with me wherever we, uh, wherever we go to speak. Whether it's Hawaii, is a great one, or whether it's uh, Boston, which we were at a couple of weeks ago. So, um, if you cannot remember, oh, I'm supposed to. This is supposed there, to be working. I know. Oh. I think it is. But okay. Have All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, Sorry about that. No, I just uh, lost my California. train of thought. Yeah, I'm in California. Thank yeah. you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll forget what happens. But it's so good to be here with you tonight, and it is truly an honor for me to be at Biola University in this uh, event, at this event tonight. Tomorrow morning we speak, I believe, in the chapel. chapel. So um, I've heard about Biola for many, many years. And uh, here I am, and uh, I'm, I'm amazed and honored to be here and to be part of this event. So um, thank you, Greg, uh, for the introduction. Well, I don't know about you, but I am grateful tonight that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Amen. Now, maybe you're not like me. Maybe you don't feel ordinary. <laughs> I feel ordinary and I'm okay with that because I love the fact that God takes ordinary people and if you just read the Bible there's been there's story after story about ordinary people and God did extraordinary things with them and I think that's just the way God works so I truly am honored to be here tonight to share my story. Kristen, thank you so much for picking us up at the airport yesterday <laughs> and being a great chauffeur and uh, for your hospitality. It was uh, wonderful to meet you and thank you for that. So tonight, uh, you can sit back and relax. I'm not giving a lecture. <laughs> oh, maybe you came for a lecture, I'm not sure, but uh, I really just came to share my story for God's glory. And I'm just grateful that you're here tonight to enjoy what God has done for me. Linda, thank you for coming tonight. Linda, along with her husband, Nat, thank you for coming tonight. Psalm 40, verse one through three. This is my testimony. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me. And then he lifted me up out of a slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he placed my feet upon a rock. And he gave me a firm foundation to stand upon. And then he put a new song in my heart a song of praise many will see and fear and put their trust in him my story for god's glory there's a line in ecclesiastes that says there is nothing new under the sun and i was thinking about that on my way out today and i thought you know that's true but the day that you were born, something new happened. There is no one on planet Earth from the beginning of time until tonight that has your DNA. Wow, is that amazing to you? I, that's amazing to me. So you have something new to offer this world, whether it's a Chick-fil-A operator, <laughs> whether it's a professor, whether it's the president of the organization of this college, whatever your role is, 
you have something to offer this world that no one else can do. What is it? I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about my story and then end with the power of purpose. You were created for a very specific purpose. There are lots of things that will happen to you in your life that may derail you. I know. But I'm here tonight to share with you how God took me from a broken heart, a broken place, shattered dreams, and he truly set my feet upon a rock. Being broken in spirit from 1974 to 1984 had me believing absolutely believing that God was finished with me. That I would be of no value to God or his kingdom or his people. In 1984, my husband and I walked into a church in Austin, Texas, broken in spirit. We were welcomed by the pastor and his wife, Tom and Brenda Wilson. They became Jesus to us and restored us. Their love and the people in that congregation restored us back to spiritual health. I had no idea at that time that God had Auntie Anne's on his mind. I had no clue. I'm gonna fast forward now to February of 1988. I remember the first days of Auntie Anne's. How many here tonight have, okay, this is a Christian university, so I'm assuming that everybody will be honest here tonight. <laughs> That's a good assumption, right? Yes. Okay, so my question is, how many of you here tonight have never had an Auntie Anne pretzel? I want you to raise your hand. Oh, Linda, where have you been? <laughs> it's either, you know, we're in 46 states and in like 26 countries, and Linda just informed me over 1,600 locations. So I'm really wondering where in this world do you live? <laughs> I don't know. But we'll have, to, we'll have to do something about that. Actually, if you raise your hand, Fi, do you have coupons with you? Okay, if you, this is the real test. If you raised your hand and you never had an Auntie Anne pretzel, we're gonna make sure that you have the opportunity and my sister Fi, after we're finished, she'll be back at the table over there and she will give you a coupon. How about that? Okay, now, I'm just saying, the rest of you, you're gonna have to be honest. So if you've had a pretzel before, no coupon for you. All right, <laughs> whatever. Wow, Linda, I think you have a few more customers after today. Hopefully you have a few more customers. The first day of Auntie Anne's really became, it was a new day for me, but it became my new normal. The purpose that we went into business was it made Auntie Anne's an unstoppable force. The purpose we went into business was to give financially. I have to tell you, there were many days in the life of Auntie Anne's that I wanted to quit. 
I think Linda saw a few days like that. She saw me a number of times, and there were many times. I wanted to quit because I didn't think that I had what it takes to be an entrepreneur. I didn't think that I had what it takes to run a business. I really didn't think that I could do it. So therefore, I became very, very good at two things, crying and praying. <laughs> it's a pretty good combination. Actually, you may want to try that. Guys as well as girls, OK? Men and women, you may both do that. It's all right. But I did. I really became an expert at crying and praying. It's the only thing I knew how to do. But every time I wanted to quit, I would hear the word. I would feel the word. Purpose. You can't stop now. And Proverbs, the book of Proverbs became my daily nourishment. And purpose gave me the energy to keep going. A little bit about my history my, as a child. I was born a little Amish girl in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Now, please don't ask me the question, are you still Amish? <laughs> Because I will ask you, do I look Amish? <laughs> okay, there you go, that's your answer. No, I am no longer Amish. I was about 19 years old when my husband and I left. Uh, we got married, and at that time was when we made the transition. So I was born a little Amish girl in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Five boys, three girls, one mom, one dad. You know, the old fashioned way. 10 of us. We were raised to love God and to love each other. <laughs> That's an amazing idea, thought now, isn't it? Love your family members, your siblings, brothers and sisters, mom and dad, yes. I knew at a very early age that I wanted to please God. And I wanted to please my parents. I really didn't understand that God had a specific purpose for me, but I had a very real sense that I wanted to serve him. Faith was a part of our everyday life on the farm, and I accepted Christ at the age of 12. Mom and dad taught us many things on the farm, simple things. Work hard. I said, work hard. We, we lived, my dad lived in an era that I believe was like the task-oriented era, era. It's like, you got a job to do? Do whatever it takes to get it done and do it well. Task-oriented. Today, we live in a very different era. It's the time oriented. I mean, employers, business owners, I mean, you know, when you hire somebody, what is one of the first questions they ask? Um, excuse me, how soon could I have my first vacation? Uh, how many perks do I have if I come to work for you? Um, do I have 30 hours or do I have to work 40? Time oriented. That's the world in which we live. A big shift from task oriented to time oriented. My dad said to work hard. We hear the line a lot today, work smarter. <laughs> My dad made me believe if I work hard, I am smart. Some of you get that. Thank you very much. <laughs> they taught us how to work together as a family. The team approach. Be kind to each other. My mom said every day, all eight of us heard this every day, right, Fi? Little children love each other. Do not give each other pain. When one speaks to you in anger, do not answer them again. Be kind to each other. 
every day we heard that. I believe that one of the greatest lessons I learned on the farm was to persevere. I'm my own definition of what that actually means. I think it simply means you do what you don't feel like doing. You do it anyway. I believe that a successful entrepreneur is someone who will do something that other people don't feel like doing. Would you agree? Some of you understand that. Well, I did lots of persevering on the farm. It's where I learned to develop the love for baking. At the age of 12, I would make 60 or 70 pies and cakes by myself in the basement of our old farmhouse in a big old pizza oven. And I'd walk down there, wipe the tears from my eyes because I did not want to do that. My mom and dad would come home from market that night and my dad was so proud and he would tell every customer my daughter made those pies, my daughter made those cakes. So at the age of 12, my bakery was pretty well, it had reached a peak. <laughs> like I can sell my wares, my goods, my baked goods. And my dad was proud of me. That was, there was something about all of that that really set the pace for me. I married a hardworking young Amish man. And together we set out to fulfill our dreams. I really thought I hit the jackpot the day I married Jonas Byler. Now, with a name like Jonas Byler, you know that he was Amish. It's just, <laughs> you don't have to wonder. Yes, he, he was Amish. We were young, we were innocent and filled with love for each other and for God. And we were living our dream as a young Amish girl. All I ever wanted in life was my very own family. And we were enjoying that. I have to tell you though, 46 years of being married to this man, September the 14th, we celebrate our 46 years. He's not quite as tall. <laughs> His last doctor checkup, he's a half inch shorter. His hair is not so dark. But he's still really handsome. And I still believe I hit the jackpot the day I married Jonas Spiler. God gave me more than I deserved. And young people in the room today, if you're not married, old or young, I should say, the secret is find someone <laughs> that loves God more than he loves you. Amen. That is not a guarantee. But I can tell you, that's a very good start in a relationship. In a few short years after being married, our dreams were broken. Our 19-month-old little girl, Angela, was killed in a tragic farm accident as she was walking from our little double wide trailer to my mom and dad's house just up the lane. It was during that time that she was run over by a bobcat, which my sister was driving at the time, and she was killed instantly. It changed my life. It changed my whole life, that moment. My grief was too deep for words. And I began to withdraw into a place of silence. My husband and I drifted apart and we simply could not communicate or connect ever again after that. There may as well have been the Great Wall of China between us. It was impossible to connect. This took me into, great into a, a great, deep depression. And based on that, I went to our pastor, who we thought was a good man. 
at that time. And I walked into his office that Monday morning, about five months after our daughter was killed. And as I left his office, he seduced me and I stayed in an abusive relationship for six long years. When I say that, I am immediately remember those years. But I also think about immediately, wow, <laughs> that was my life, but this is my life today. Mm. The grief that I experienced with Angela as deep as that was, the abuse took me to the abyss of hell, of despair, of darkness, of guilt, of suicide. And that's when I began to feel like life was over for me. I began to experience pain Blame and shame for over 25 years living in depression. I thought I was going to choke to death spiritually and physically. So that's why I say today I'm standing here in this place because of the power of grace and one good man, Jesus and Jonas. And today, I can walk with both of them. It's amazing to me to be able to say that to you tonight. I'm grateful that they saved my life. I didn't realize at that time, but I've discovered late, many years later, as was said earlier, out of our pain, our purpose was born. Through our tragedy, Jonas and I began to put our life to, back together again with the help of marriage counseling. And Jonas decided, this is exciting. I want to help other couples get through their struggles and their marriages, just help people. So he began to study psychology and became a counselor and did free counseling in our community for over 15 years. When he started counseling, and he was doing it as a free service, that meant one thing for me. I needed to go to work and make the dough. <laughs> <laughs> the pretzel dough. That is. <laughs> My decision to go to work was not based on a, I mean, was based on our financial need and not on a smart business plan. I went to work because we had a need. My journey became Auntie Anne's and corporate America from a housewife to corporate America almost overnight. Auntie Anne's is simply a modern day business miracle, a miracle something that defies the odds. I knew nothing about business, but I was about to find out. Auntie Anne started in 1988. And we knew from the very early days of months of Auntie Anne's that Auntie Anne's was created to give. God wanted to use Auntie Anne's as a vehicle for missions. I can tell you that purpose with passion is dangerous. You have the two components. You have a purpose and you have passion. 
let me tell you something, you're dangerous. You will get something accomplished. You will accomplish the purpose for which you were created. Purpose is defined as the object toward which one strives to intend or resolve to perform or accomplish a result that is desired. It's determination or resolution. I'm here to tell you tonight that when you discover your purpose, you will encounter obstacles. Guaranteed. I don't know if I have time to share. I don't know where I'm at with time. I think that there, two, two years ago, I want to give you an illustration of what I mean by purpose. We were in Ethiopia, my sister Fi and I. And one day we went out to see the stick women. And they say there's about maybe four or 5,000 stick women in Ethiopia. They're in a very small pocket right out of uh, Addis Ababa. So we went to see the stick women. As we're driving up Three Mile Hill, we get to the top and we see women loaded down, burdened down with a bundle of sticks on their back, 10 to 12 feet in diameter and over 100 pounds in weight. So you look at these women and you're thinking, how can they do this? They're bent over like this, carrying this 100 pound round tied together bundle of sticks. Their shoes are worn out. They were in sandals or some kind of a flat shoe that there's nothing left to the shoe. Their purpose is to get to the top of the mountain every morning for 60 cents a day to feed their children. I said, when you know what your purpose is, you will encounter obstacles. Their obstacles were sticks in a bundle 10 feet or 12 feet in diameter, 100 pounds in weight on their back, small in statue, shoes that were worn out, up a three mile hill and down the same day. Others saw them as second class citizens and would make fun of them. They pressed on and they press on every day because they know what their purpose is, to feed their children. That may be extreme, but that's a very good description of purpose. And they did all of that with a smile on their face. Unbelievable. Find your purpose, but expect obstacles. Three things that I did not have when I started Auntie Anne's and the obstacles that I had to overcome. There were many, but three things in particular, education, formal education, capital, and a business plan. Huh? Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're still awake, you're with me. Good, thank you. I think that if I'd gone to college, they would have taught me those are three very important components. Uh -huh. Formal education, capital, and a business plan. I'm not a dropout, so don't, really, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not a dropout. I went through the eighth grade because that's Amish culture. It's what you do. And when you're done with eighth grade, you go on the farm and you help mom and dad or you go get a job. It's what we did. It's all I knew. So I'm not a dropout. At the age of 50, after we started the company, I was 40 when we started Auntie Anne's. And at the age of 50, I decided as a good leader, as somebody that needs to be an example to employees, especially the, the employees in our stores, 
I felt like it was important for them to understand, I believe that education's important. So I went and got my GED at the age of 50, and I really passed with flying colors. So, <laughs> yay! <laughs> I always enjoyed school. I loved learning. But the interesting part about receiving my GED is that one week before I received my GED, I received my first of two honorary doctorate degrees. <laughs> So God has a sense of humor, I, a sense of humor. I said he uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. We had no capital. We had come back after living in Texas and we had $25 cash. We moved back from Texas after living there 10 years. Had no plan, had no 401k. I didn't know what a 401k was. I didn't know what CDs were. I didn't know what I, I knew nothing, period, about business or banking. Oh, I, I mean, I had a checkbook, so I was able to, you know, write checks out, but that's it. We had no money when we came back in 1987, and we had no business plan because we really didn't know that we needed one to start our business. As the company grew, I began to realize the three things that I didn't have, I should have had. <laughs> and I felt intimidated as I made my rounds in the business world. And I became fearful. When our fear is bigger than our faith, our purpose will be blocked. I had to get over the fear. Everyone I met had a formal education. Everybody I met knew more about business than I did. I began to whine, you know, whine and cry to my husband. Oh, I wish I would be <laughs> like him, like her. I wish I, huh. He said to me one day, stop whining. Stop whining. And just be who God made you. That sounds like simple, not too profound. But at the time, it was very important for me to hear those words. We spend a lot of time wishing we were someone else. It's wasted time, right. wasted energy. Remember, you're the only one with your DNA. You're special. You are unique. There's no one in the world like you. No one. It's during that time, God took me to the verse in Psalm 32, verse 8. He said, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way that you should go. <laughs> wow. Wow, God said that to me. <laughs> I was like, really? I'll instruct you and I'll teach you in the way that you should go and I'll counsel you with my eye. And I took him literal. And I went to my friend and I said, please draw me, do an art rendering of me it's sitting in an office, in an office, me on one side of the desk and Jesus on the other. Because I need to remember that. I need to see that. I need to know every single day that he will instruct me and that he'll teach me in the way that I should go. So I had this drawing, it was beautiful, painted. Put it right behind my desk so that whenever anyone came in, they saw the picture. Do you remember that picture, Linda, or no? You do not remember that picture. You may never have been in my office. I didn't invite her to my office. Okay, sorry, Linda. <laughs> but I decided with that inspiration to stop whining about what I didn't have and focus on what I had. <laughs> what 
did I have? What do you have? Wow. It was very clear to me there was three things that I had. I had a great purpose. I had great product and I had great people. And when you focus on what you have, <laughs> you don't have any time left to think about what you don't have. <laughs> Purpose will impact everything that you do. I discovered three things about purpose. Purpose will give you power to overcome any obstacle that you will face on any given day. And I faced a lot of them. Remember, I didn't know anything about business. And then we decided to go in a franchise business? <laughs> really? What is franchising? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I, purpose gave me power to overcome any obstacle. And purpose will give you a passion that is unbelievable. And purpose will give you an in, a position of influence. Number one, overcoming power. The power to stay when I wanted to run. I know I'm not alone. I mean, I, 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 I'm sure there are many of you in this room that can relate to what I'm saying. It's so big. It's so overwhelming. It's too much. And you want to run away. Purpose will give you the power to stay. And when we started Auntie Anne's in 1988 with a $6,000 loan from my father-in-law, we bought our first market stand. By 1992, we were opening our 100th store. The growth for me was fast and intense. By 1995, we were opening our first international store halfway around the world in Jakarta, Indonesia. <laughs> I mean, why? <laughs> you know, people will say to me, why, why did you go to Jakarta, Indonesia? Well, there's a big story about all that, so I'm not, I can't explain that, but let me tell you, my simple answer to the question is, I guess I thought that if we could do business halfway around the world, anything closer would be easier. <laughs> There were times I wanted to run. Auntie Anne stretched me to the point of personal, professional, and spiritual exhaustion. What I learned early on as the founder and CEO of a fast-growing organization was that if we were going to grow as an organization then, and fulfill our, our purpose, then I, the owner, the founder, the leader, then I would have to grow personally. You cannot grow professionally if you do not grow personally. We need to walk, we need to do it hand in hand, professional and personal growth. Well, I've seen professionals at 50 years old <laughs> and I could soon tell they never grew up. You know what I'm saying? Why do you see older folks in the workplace and they're acting like kids? It's because they have not grown up personally. So we need to grow in every way. And I figured it out that if I'm going to overcome adverse circumstances in my life and in my business, then I must overcome my employees? <laughs> no. Of the corporate America? No. I must overcome me. I must overcome myself if I am going to overcome adverse circumstances. That meant to me to live a life, I'm sorry, to live a life of purpose meant then that I had to get over me. I had to grow in every aspect of my life, which meant to read books. I went to seminars. I went to conferences. So I was so sick of going to conferences week after week, month after month, 
leadership, management, franchise consult, you name it, I was there because I knew I had to grow. Over time, I became comfortable in my own skin. and confident in the position that God put me in. And it became very clear to me, it's not about me, but it was about the purpose. Number two, purpose will give you an unbelievable passion. I became passionate about our employees and I always, I've always been passionate about the product. Today, I don't own the company anymore, but the unfortunate part is that my name is still there. <laughs> and I, Linda, I cannot help myself. If I come to your store and the pretzels are not perfect, I just, mm. uh, she knows, okay, she knows. I just cannot help myself. I'm passionate about the product and the employees and their needs. And I'm here to tell you tonight that if you care about your employees, they will be loyal to your purpose. Guaranteed. I read a book on Lincoln on Leadership. Lincoln was dubbed with an MBWA. Sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? That'd be my, well, MBWA. Manage by walking around. I could relate to that. It's all I ever did, walk around in my office and talk to people. I knew if I talked to them and cared for them. I mean, I didn't know at that time, but I wanted to know them and care for them. I loved them and discovered much later, if you care for your people, they'll be loyal to your purpose. Number three, purpose will give you an influential position and I'm about to close. When I started Antienne's, I was surprised at how business was being done because remember, I didn't know anything about business. I, I, I hadn't made my rounds out there in corporate yet. I didn't know. I mean, I grew up on an Amish farm. It was all about integrity. I knew that Antienne's had to be the kind of company that would honor God in all that we did. Can we do it perfectly 100% all the time? No. Mm -mm. Or maybe you can, Chick-fil-A folks over there. Uh, you know, maybe you can. But I, I believe the, the, the model is there and to be excellent and to care about building a company of integrity. I wanted to be a light in the business world. So I took my position of influence to introduce the concept of light to franchisees, employees, vendors. Light, we did the acrostic, in L, lead by example. I, invest in employees. G, give freely. H, honor God. And T, treat all business contacts with respect. And light became the grid that we looked through when making decisions on a daily basis. Who would have thought that a pretzel, it's a common pretzels date all the way back to 610 AD. Who would have thought, who would have dreamed, who could have known that this Auntie Anne pretzel would make its way around the world. I can tell you that God took this little Amish girl from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, all around the world selling pretzels. <laughs> you really can take the girl out of the Amish. You can, but you cannot take the Amish out of the girl. Impossible. So if my speech sounds a little Amish, a little Dutch, it's because she's still in there. I want you to hear tonight that all things truly are possible. <laughs> With faith, hard work, perseverance, Thousands of lives have been influenced every day because of Auntie Anne's. They have provided a better quality of life for people around the world. I met a man a couple, two years ago, three years ago from Abbas, I'm sorry, from Egypt. His name was Abbas. I met him at the Auntie Anne convention. 
And he came over to me and gave me a big arms around hug from Egypt and said, thank you for creating Auntie Anne's. We're very successful there. We sold the company of five and built the family center to help families in need. While living my purpose, I felt a great sense of satisfaction, but also a great sense of responsibility. It's what happens when you have a purpose. But all during the years, I kept going back to the promise that God gave to me. I'll teach you. <laughs> I'll instruct you. I'll help you. And I can tell you, he was faithful to his promise. And he not only taught me, but he walked with me every step of the way. And he helped me. While you're living your purpose, you'll discover that you can do more than you ever dreamed of or even thought possible. What is your purpose? If you don't know what it is, it's okay. You'll discover it if you want to. Whatever it is, it will carry you through difficult times. It'll help you overcome any obstacle that you face. I know that today's business climate is tough. You know, we still have dreams and ideas and visions about what we want to do. I'm saying you can. You can still do it all. I believe that your purpose is timeless. And no matter what it looks like, what the world looks like, when God makes his purpose clear to you, he will always make a way. <laughs> he will. In closing, purpose, I can tell you from experience that purpose will give you overcoming pa power, unbelievable passion, and an influential position. When you live out your purpose, you'll be effective. You'll be effective. And God will be glorified through you. Mother Teresa once said, you don't have to be famous to be effective. You just have to be faithful. <laughs> Thank you tonight for allowing me to share my story for God's glory. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.